Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here to uh, conduct this session, which is Hong Kong as the premier hub for offshore renminbi business. To begin with, I will just ex explain renminbi. What does it mean? Uh, one of the participants asked a question. It really mean the Chinese currency. Renmin means people, people's money. It means uh, yuan, for those of just like US dollar. Now, I propose to divide this session into three parts. Uh, part one will be a very short video that the Hong Kong Monetary Authority produced before to five minutes. Then it will be followed by a PowerPoint presentation for around 15 minutes. And then I have a very good uh, distinguished panel of speakers who will join me on stage to uh, talk about uh, renminbi offshore business in Hong Kong. China's economy has experienced a phenomenal average annual growth rate of 10% over the past 20 years. As China's economy continues to expand rapidly, there is increasing demand for wider use of renminbi globally. With progressive liberalization of China's policies, there is now the option to conduct trade and investment with China in renminbi. What are the key benefits of using renminbi for trade and investment? Using renminbi to conduct trade and investment with China can reduce the costs and risks involved in currency exchange. That means savings and more competitive pricing to clients. Using renminbi can also bring more business by reaching out to Chinese customers and suppliers that prefer to settle transactions in renminbi instead of foreign currencies. Moreover, the settlement cycle can be shortened, allowing business to be done more efficiently. Hong Kong is the gateway for doing business with China. Hong Kong is the premier international financial center in Asia and ranked among the freest and most competitive economies in the world. Hong Kong is the gateway for China's trade. Nearly 30% of China's trade with the rest of the world is intermediated by Hong Kong. Hong Kong is also the hub for China's inward and outward direct investments, accounting for 50 to 60% of these activities in each direction. Hong Kong is the offshore renminbi business center supporting banks and companies in other parts of the world in developing offshore renminbi business. Handling nearly 3 trillion yuan of renminbi trade settlement transactions in 2012, Hong Kong is the global hub for renminbi trade settlement serving China's trading partners in different parts of the world. Hong Kong has the largest pool of renminbi liquidity outside mainland China. The outstanding renminbi deposits increased tremendously in the past few years, reaching over 800 billion yuan in 2013. Hong Kong is the center for offshore renminbi bonds, known as dim sum bonds, that attracts international issuers and investors. The market has grown phenomenally in size, with 80 renminbi bond issuers from Asia, Australia, Europe, the Middle East and America, having raised more than 100 billion yuan in 2012. A wide range of renminbi financial instruments and products are available in Hong Kong for investors, ranging from currency futures, equity securities, hedging and risk management instruments to insurance schemes and investment funds accessing both the onshore and offshore markets. Hong Kong has developed a global network of renminbi clearing and settlement platform that links the world with China. More than 200 banks participate directly in this platform and 90% of them are banks with overseas networks, altogether covering over 30 countries in six continents. In addition, Hong Kong is also the renminbi correspondent banking hub, helping banks from different parts of the world to handle renminbi activities at the wholesale level. 
More than 1,500 of such RMB correspondent banking accounts are maintained with banks in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, your gateway to China. The global one stop services platform for your offshore RMB business. What I propose to do uh, through this presentation is to uh, cover four parts. First of all, elaborate on China's expanding links with the world and what does it mean for all of us. And then Hong Kong's role in China's growth story. And then talk about internationalization, Renmin B. And then finally, Hong Kong as the global hub for offshore Renmin B business. This morning, I think uh, very great discussions. I, I was really impressed by a uh, description used by William Fung. Talk about uh, China tends to operate in a 30-year cycle. The first cycle was 1949 to 1979. Uh, a lot of things happened, but basically China actually isolated itself from the Western world. But then in the second 30-year cycle, starting from 1979, when Deng Xiaoping launched the reform and opening program, uh, within 30 years' time, China has achieved miraculous growth in GDP. You can see from this slide, uh, China in 2012, the GDP has reached over 8 trillion US dollars. It's now the second largest economy in the world. But back in 1979, the per capita GDP of China was $270. It was less than one US dollar a day. So within a 30 year period, uh, the growth story of China has lifted hundreds of millions of Chinese from poverty into uh, what we call some kind of a closer to middle class income level. Now, lots of people would view this 30 year cycle as a phenomenal, cha phenomenal change in China. China has now regarded us as the manufacturing hub center of the world, it's a factory world and is exporting lots of consumer goods to uh, the rest of the world. But I think in the second, in the next 30 year cycle, from now on, the next 20, 30 years, how do we see China? I think the key is that we should adjust to changes in China and its relationship with the world. What I propose to set, uh, set out in this slide is that an $8 trillion economy is a very big market not only for Chinese companies, for companies of the world. The retail sales last year reached $3 trillion, and China imported $1.8 trillion of goods and services. Now, I think uh, it is worth noting, of course, that in the imports, some of them are raw materials and spare parts will be exported, but China's consumption only accounts for 50% of GDP. So it's a very low level compared with or other advanced economy. So there's a lot of headroom for this uh, consumption demand to grow in the future. Now this is a slide showing the uh, US imports from China and US export to China. Of course, you can see from this slide, the blue line uh, in absolute number is much bigger than the red line. But you have to notice the change, the speed of change. U.S. export to China has been growing a lot faster than U.S. imports from China. The number we have over 100 billion US dollars. If you add 37 billion dollars of exports from U.S. to Hong Kong, it's a very, very big amount and it's growing very, very fast. So I think the point I'm trying to make is that China, the growth story actually means a lot more business opportunities for trade, for companies in the US and the rest of the world. Now let me talk about the investment links in China. The blue bars represent the FDIs into China. And you can see that the uh, amount of FDIs uh, flowing to China has been increasingly steadily. In the last three, two, three years, it's over 100 billion US dollars per annum. Of course, the money went to China in the form of uh, setting up factories, companies, hotels, as Ronnie Chen said, shopping malls, meeting the consumer demands. 
But what I intend to highlight is the red bars. The red bars represent the amount of overseas direct investment from China, going overseas for mergers, acquisitions. The amount of ODIs from China was negligible before 2004, 2005, you can see from the slide, but actually rose very fast, very, very sharply. It was 77 billion US dollars last year. And that is very, very significant. I won't be surprised in a couple of years' time, the amount of ODIs would probably equal or even surpass the amount of FDIs. Now, where does Hong Kong, how does Hong Kong feature in this China growth story? First of all, let me talk about trade. China's external trade in 2011 was around $3.6 trillion, a very, very big amount. But of this total trade in China, for re-exporting offshore, tra uh, offshore trade, Hong Kong intermediate around 27% of China's external trade. So Hong Kong has always been an important trading hub for China. I talk about FDIs, and there was $112 billion in 2012. And of this, 60%, 60% of this FDIs came from Hong Kong. When I said Hong Kong included many Western companies, US companies, which are registered, incorporated, domiciled in Hong Kong, and then these companies use Hong Kong as the base, as a springboard to reach out to China, as Hong Kong has always been the single largest source of FDIs into China. I talk about ODIs, uh, it was $75 billion in 2011, among that, around 50% of the ODIs went to or through Hong Kong. I must emphasize this, for this amount, it doesn't mean all the money, 50%, invested and spent in Hong Kong. I think as the, uh, early this morning, the panelists talked about, many mainland companies found it very convenient, attractive, to use Hong Kong as a springboard to reach out to other countries when they uh, wish to make investments. Now this is a slide showing that the role of Hong Kong in providing funding for mainland companies. This is the market capitalization of Hong Kong stock markets. You can see that in 2001, about 12, 13 years ago, the amount of mainland companies, which is the red portion of the bar uh, in the Hong Kong stock market, represented around one quarter of the total market cap. But now the ratio, the proportion has gone to over 50 percent. In fact, it was 57 percent uh, in 2012. That means Hong Kong has been has become the major funding hub for mainland companies wishing to seek IPO listing and rights issue. Now let me talk about the use of RMB, uh, a new era for China's trade investment, because. Prior to 2009, it wasn't lot, lot long ago, renminbi was not allowed to be used in external trade or in bilateral investment. So you have a situation in which this onshore renminbi market is growing fast, it's a very big market, but offshore, there wasn't much renminbi uh, being used because it just wasn't allowed. But what has happened since 2009 is that, first of all, there's a bridge, what we call trade bridge. The trade bridge was built, and allowing traffic through this bridge between the onshore market and offshore market, allowing renminbi to be used in trade settlement. And uh, this is the pilot scheme which was launched in 2009. And the second bridge is the direct investment bridge. In the past, like trade, direct investment in China can only be used in foreign currencies. You remit foreign currency like dollar, Hong Kong dollar, euro, yen in China, and then you do the conversion before you can make investment and payment in China for your projects. But then this bridge has been built, meaning that foreign companies wishing to invest in China can, if they have RMB funding, either through the issue of bonds or bank lending, remit renminbi direct into China to make payments. That means they don't have to convert foreign currencies into renminbi. 
And the third bridge is what I call the portfolio investment bridge, meaning that um, foreign residents, foreign companies wishing to invest in the financial markets in China can go through this bridge and make investments. And similarly, residents in China can make investments overseas through this portfolio investment. This is a new era for China. And for example, the trade channel, before 2009, the amount of trade set in RMB was zero. In the first year, the proportion of China exchange trade set in RMB was 2%, and then grew to 4%, and last year it was 10%. 10% of China's exchange trade was settled in RMB. Uh, now let me talk about Hong Kong's role as the hub for offshore RMB business. We all talk about trade settlements, and in 2012, for the whole year, we settled over 2.6 trillion yuan in trade settlement. In the first four months of this year, we have settled 1.1 trillion yuan. We talk about the liquidity. Uh, the videos show that the amount of renminbi liquidity pool in Hong Kong has been growing very steadily. It's now over 837 billion yuan the largest liquidity pool outside China. And then we talk about the dim sum bond, RMB bond market uh, has been very, very, uh, growing very fast. Last year is over 112 billion yuan worth of bonds issued. And in the first four months of this year, it's around 37 billion yuan. Now, Hong Kong, the offshore market does not serve only Hong Kong-based customers. Hong Kong actually offers a platform that serves domestic customers as well as customers around the world. As you can see from all these numbers, we have over 200 banks participating directly in Hong Kong's RMB clearing platform. And more importantly, we have over 1,500 corresponding accounts opened by overseas banks. Meaning what? Meaning that overseas banks are using Hong Kong as their kind of a, a correspondent bank to make payments and also do all kinds of banking services. And we have a, a very efficient uh, clearing and settlement system. The daily turnover, average daily turnover of our TGS system in Hong Kong is over 370 billion yuan a day compared to 120 billion yuan a year ago. And we have also extended the operating hours of the payment system from 6.30 Hong Kong time to 11.30 Hong Kong time, covering the major part of the business day of in Europe and morning session of the uh, North American markets. And we also provide a PVP, payment versus payment facility, for renminbi versus US dollar FX settlement. I, I think, I think that presentation will actually explain to you why we think Hong Kong is the uh, uh, very efficient and attractive platform for overseas banks and overseas corporates using Hong Kong to conduct their RMB businesses. I think, um, let me then, I think, proceed to part three. Would the MC invite the uh, panelists to come on stage? Thank you, Mr. Chan. May I also invite our speakers to join Mr. Chan on the stage? Ms. Anita Fung, Chief Executive Officer, Hong Kong, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. <laughs> Mr. He Gongbei, JP, Vice Chairman and Chief Executive, Bank of China, Hong Kong. Mr. Paul Kennedy, Chief Financial Officer, Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing. <laughs> Mr. Gregory Weigard, Assistant Treasurer, Air Products and Chemicals Incorporated.
Well, I think uh, following the video and the PowerPoint presentation, we have a very distinguished uh, group of panelists here today. Uh, I would uh, ask them questions and for them to comment on. And I, after this q and I think we will allow some time for the floor to raise questions. We will try to answer those questions as we go along. Uh, first of all, I would uh, ask Mr. He your question. Uh, the Bank of China, Hong Kong, is the clearing bank uh, in Hong Kong for renminbi. And the question that many uh, participants would like to know is that what, is, what are the advantages of using renminbi in offshore trade and also investment? And what does Hong Kong offer in terms of a platform or hub for offshore renminbi businesses? Uh, well, you know, RMB business actually is uh, one of my favorite subjects. And it's a very exciting market in Hong Kong, lots going on. And why foreign investors or foreign trading company would like to use RMB? You know, in, in the past, most of the trading companies in China, they use US dollars and other hot currencies to settle their trade. But nowadays, there's another currency, RMB. This, you know, using RMB to settle their trade is, is going to eliminate all, uh, the currency risk you know, it's going to, uh, they don't have to do any currency conversion afterwards. And by doing that, actually, they're going to save some currency cost in terms of risk, in terms of hedging, things like that. And then in that case, when you do trade with your China partners, Chinese partners, perhaps you can negotiate a better price in terms of RB. But of course, in terms of your US dollar, and you know, when it comes to the appreciation of RB, I don't know, you know, when you suddenly got stuck with, the, you know, appreciating uh, RMB, perhaps, you know, I don't know whether it's cheaper or more expensive, but at least, you know, when they use RMB to settle your trade, perhaps to them, it's a cost saving, and then perhaps, you know, they will be able to offer a slightly cheaper price in terms of the commodity trade. And uh, as we estimated, about 10 to 12 percent of China trade now is being settled in RMB, and 70% of that actually cross-border trade settlement. 70% of that actually is cleared through Hong Kong. So, but you know, if you have an investment in China, if you have a China, you have RMB revenue, then it's another story. You know, when you now you're allowed to remit RMB uh, dividends in RMB out of China. And RMB is appreciating currency. If you're willing to accumulate certain RMB assets, as everyone knows, that our return on RMB assets, for the time being at least, is generally higher than most of the other currencies, be it US dollar, be it Euro, be it Japanese yen. So you can enjoy a high return if you accumulate a certain amount of RMB assets. But you know, when you have substantial trade position with China, you import and export, and naturally, when you use RMB, perhaps you know you can offset the currency risk uh, by doing import and export at the same time without taking additional currency risk. Hong Kong actually is the most efficient market in terms of RMB clearing. We, the Bank of China, Hong Kong, we are the clearing bank for Hong Kong, and we do it through PBOC in Shenzhen. There is a very effective uh, national clearing uh, system called CNAPS, and all the commercial banks in China, they are linked to CNAPS, and all the branches of all the commercial banks in China are linked to the CNAPS. So once you make settlement, trade settlement, or any Chinese, uh, or any uh, RMB uh, payment, actually, you know, just, it's very efficient, it's very quick, and just a few seconds, in the matter of a few seconds, your money can reach uh, the beneficiary accounts. But whether your bank or the, the bank of the beneficiary is going to inform the beneficiary or not, you know, it's another story. So it depends, that varies from bank to bank. Some banks offer immediate information to the beneficiary. Others, they just wait for half a day or maybe a full day. So, you know, that varies a lot between banks. Uh, the other thing actually, you know, in Hong Kong, we have the deepest liquidity pool. As Norman just pointed out, 
the, the, the liquidity pool now in Hong Kong is about 810 billion RMB. And that actually hasn't included the amount of securities, debt securities outstanding in Hong Kong. The, the amount of debt securities, dim sum bonds, now outstanding in Hong Kong is about 240 billion uh, RMB. And of course, there are a lot of new issues coming out uh, every month. For instance, for the first, first four months of this year, new issues actually reached about 44 billion RMB. So the market is very active, and the market is also very creative. If you want to use Hong Kong, uh, if you want to use RMB to settle trade or do your investment, you can do hedging, you can do interest rate swap, you can do forward transactions, you can do options. You know, with my, my friends in HSBC, you know, we're certainly trying very hard actually to produce as many products, to manufacture as many products as possible to support Hong Kong as the premier offshore RMB center. Uh, thank you, Gary. I think we could just add one point. Um, many trading companies or companies trading with China will ask the same question. What is the main advantage of using RMB instead of dollar or euro uh, in settlements? Uh, in one of the road shows like this one, I, I, one of the panelists from Maine in China, uh, he works for a uh, construction equipment manufacturing company. And then he, he, he said this, he was negotiating, his company negotiating a big contract, supply contract of heavy construction equipment to a Middle East customer. Uh, it's a big contract, it's delivered over a four year period. And then they were negotiating in dollar as usual. And then towards the end of these negotiations, they asked a the question, would the buyer be willing to pay or denominate and pay in B? And the customer say, what is in it for us? What's the advantage of making payment in RMB? The supplier said, if you do that, we give you 5% discount. And 5% was a very significant amount in that particular contract. So they signed the contract in RMB. They were one of the first contract uh, uh, to be denominated and set to in RMB. So when you deal with uh, um, suppliers in China, and if you are prepared to consider the use of Roman B, you may send a better chance of getting a better pricing in, in this context. Now, may I turn to the second panelist, Anita? Uh, you work for HSBC, uh, but can you uh, comment on the point that I think CNH market has been evolving very, very uh, quickly over the last three, four years. Can you elaborate a little bit on the, how do you see, for example, the FX market, the CNH market is developing because uh, in the past when people want to buy and sell RMB, uh, they can do not, cannot do it in big volumes. So it's a situation change and can you also comment on the, uh, uh, the amount of hedging, hedging instruments available for corporates uh, trading and investing uh, in China using RMB and also how is the dim sum bond market evolving? Thank you, Norman. Uh, firstly, I think on FX, I just want to roll back a little bit in memory. I mean, we are now having a, a rather vibrant uh, offshore FX market in uh, Hong Kong for the CNH. Um, I just recall, if we think about uh, back in the 1980s, I just talked to my colleague during break time, and actually she was just born in 1980, so she didn't know anything about what happened in the 1980s as a real person. But I remember when I used to cross the border in the 1980s, uh, I used to be approached by grey market dealers trying to exchange renminbi for US dollar uh, at a discount so i.e. I can get more renminbi if I exchange across the border than actually exchange it to uh, the official market onshore. Obviously in 1990 um, then renminbi is undergoing a lot of changes, you know, people looking to buy renminbi, appreciation pressure in 2005 you do have a one-off appreciation renminbi by 2.1%. And up to now, I think RMB has appreciated 35%. And for this year alone, uh, even the RMB has now approached a structural equilibrium as per se, RMB has appreciated gradually up to date about 1% to 1.5%, depending on whether you talk about the onshore or offshore market. Now, when you think about the FX 
foreign exchange is very much fundamental when we think about developing a liberalization of a market. Um, when I talk to a lot of customers offshore, when we try to explain the emergence of renminbi in the international field and the use of renminbi for trade settlement, investment, etc., one usual question that I was being asked is, is the market liquid enough in the offshore? Can we actually do hedging, investment, etc.? Give you a little bit of a number. I think if we think about the offshore CNH market in Hong Kong, um, it has grown more than four or five times in terms of volume. Right now, on a daily basis, just on the spot, the average turnover is four billion US dollar equivalent. And if we think about on the forwards, mostly in the rather short data, anything from three months to a year, the daily turnover is six billion US dollars. So you actually have a 10 billion US dollar equivalent of a daily turnover uh, just in the offshore market. Now, I would argue, actually, this volume can only increase, and there is no inhabitant in terms of the size of this turnover. You only need to have an underlying demand and supply. And I think recent developments in the renminbi, having renminbi uh, approaching the structural equilibrium is actually a much more healthier state. Instead of a lot of the flows from pure speculative or trading, you actually do have the underlying flow more due to underlying investment flow or the trade services flow. Now, in terms of hedging, again, you, know, you have customers uh, doing business in China and investment, uh, and they're always thinking about, you know, should the market turn, you know, can I actually hedge? Or if I have a forward kind of long data commitment, can I actually hedge my interest rate <clears throat> as well as my FX? Well, the answer is you can basically now use the offshore market in Hong Kong, which is the most liquid and deep market currently, uh, to go into a whole variety of products, be it just simple FX spot or like short data forward or interest rate swap, should you have just pure interest rate between fixed and floating, or even cross-currency swap, i.e. from one currency into another currency for a particular duration. And you also have the futures market developing, and we're also having the CNH in terms of the fixing developing. So you have a more and more transparent in terms of price discovery and also a more deep market in terms of both participation from sellers and buyers as well as investors and issuers. Now, let me talk a little bit about the dim sum bond market, which is uh, very dear to my heart. You know, uh, this morning we talked about the delicious dim sum, and at a lot of different forums, you know, we're being asked as to how this name actually came about. I don't think any one of us on uh, the panel actually attributed to the name. I was told that it was in one occasion that there was something like a competition, you know, seeking for uh, um, entries for the name. And I think, you know, some of the market participants put in a dim sum, and we thought that dim sum is quite representative of Hong Kong culture, so we used the dim sum bond. But the dim sum bond market, uh, since the first issuance back in 2007, in that year we only have 10 billion issuance, uh, versus last year the gross issuance is about 270 billion. Uh, and if you think about the development of the dim sum bond market, really in the 2010, you, you have the first kind of non-bank corporates actually issue in Hong Kong. So the market has actually grown a lot over the last couple of years. Now, we're not talking about just by the size, uh, but also by the diversity of the issuers as well as the investors right now. In terms of the issuers, you have got a whole variety of issuers trying to tap into the offshore dim sum bond market in Hong Kong, ranging from uh, multilateral organization, MNCs, uh, corporates, uh, banks, non-bank financial institutions, and et cetera, and et cetera, from all sorts of different kind of national entities, whether it's European, American, I think. Uh, from the US side, we do have dim sum bond issued by Ford, three years, and also the Yum brand retail also a three-year tapping into the dim sum bond market. Uh, and I think dim sum bond in Hong Kong, or the offshore renminbi bond, has actually also evolved from a period where the supply is purely driven by relatively much lower cost of funding. Uh, and the, the investor side is very much because of the expectation of rapid appreciation of renminbi, that's why they buy the dim sum bond, to currently uh, you do have a much deeper market in the dim sum bond issuance, so the investors try to look at a combination of the credit quality, 
a combination of uh, the tenor uh, and also the size, and they also have a much deeper choice. And from the uh, investors, it's definitely not uh, just looking at the rapid appreciation, they're actually looking at the undervalue of the bond. So the market now become towards more and more kind of mature, uh, and we do expect the dim sum bond to continue. Uh, whether we'll change the name to a main cost bond or whatever, you know, we don't know. But we do expect that the issuance, you know, this year to continue, expecting about 280 to 360 billion uh, issuance this year. And so far up to date, it's pretty much on track. Uh, and the issuance of uh, the uh, dim sum also include, you know, some of the CDs issuance and, you know, various kind of uh, fixed income as well as floating rate uh, CNH issuance. Uh, the dim sum bond market has also made uh, more effective. Now we have a more developed cross-currency swap market, i.e. if you have a, a, an issuer that raised renminbi in Hong Kong, but actually you don't need to have the renminbi, you probably want the US dollar instead, there is also a cross-currency swap market that can effectively swap your renminbi back into your designated currency. And I think in terms of the uh, currency exchange, uh, what you also observe recently is you've got increased currency pairs that have got direct trading in the onshore market. Uh, that include the yen, that include, you know, just this year the Australian dollar in the onshore. That will increase the kind of liquidity and also it will fit into the development of the offshore market. So I think all in all, whether you talk about the FX market growth in depth and width, whether you talk about the hedging instrument in terms of getting into maturity and also the dim sum bond as a way of financing, I think the offshore market has all been signifying a continuous growth towards increased maturity and also with increased participation from offshore markets. Thank you, Anita. Um, our third panelist, Paul. Um, we talk about uh, companies trading with China and then we can see advantages in the, considering using B in the trade uh, settlements. And we talk about uh, making direct investment in China instead of converting foreign currency in B. Companies can now consider uh, borrowing or obtaining funding in Hong Kong and remit RMB into China and then avoiding conversion. But for the offshore RMB market to develop, there are lots of people receiving RMB, therefore accumulating RMB, and then most of them would not be content with just parking their money uh, in banks as deposits or just buying CDs. They're looking for a wide variety of investment products so that uh, the value uh, in those uh, renminbi can grow over time. So the availability of a whole variety of investment products in renminbi is very, very important for the offshore market to uh, continue to develop. So Paul, can you explain or comment on, the, on, the, on how you see this renminbi denominated investment products including instruments listed on the stock exchange. How is this market evolving? How, how can you see this uh, as it growing as in a very uh, orderly manner that can meet the investor, investor demand appetite? Well, I'm, I'm, is this on? Well, I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear that people are going to invest on the stock exchange. That's, that's really good news. Um, just, just perhaps some scene setting first of all. Um, as, as you mentioned on one of your slides, um, approximately half of the companies on, on our exchange um, are mainland related, but over 70% of the, the trading is. And as a bit of trivia, the first um, H share listing um, is coming up for its 20th anniversary, 15th of July uh, 1993 was the first uh, listing. And, and our exchange has really grown on the back of Chinese companies coming to list uh, in, the Hong Kong, in the Hong Kong market. But what we perceive, and, and as you allude to, is that the needs um, arising from increased wealth, um, continued growth, internationalization, the rem and B are changing fundamentally. So no longer can we grow just by uh, providing a venue for capital formation. We've actually got to meet these risk diversification and investment needs. So the whole business plan of the exchange hinges around anticipating the needs that will arise out of this fundamental change that's taking place. And 
you know, in order to anticipate this and, and prepare our products, we've been doing two things, two main things, I guess, over the last few years. Um, as Anita said, the first um, uh, dim sum bond was listed in 2010, but in subsequent years, we've been trying to look at our asset classes and our platforms and make sure that they're RIMMB friendly. We have to be able to offer product in RIMMB as the pool of RIMMB uh, enlarges, as people are looking for different opportunities, and we also need to provide a platform so that people can raise capital in RMB. So international companies come into our markets so are the reverse of what we've seen before. And this reflects, I think, a change from a, a capital import mode in the Chinese economy to a capital export mode. So as we, as we look across our, our platforms and asset classes, um, we've done a number of things. And, and what we're essentially doing is trying to make sure that our cash equity market is now RMB enabled. And we're able to provide a situation now where you can list in two currencies. You can list in RMB and Hong Kong dollars at the same time, dual tranches, uh, same class of shares, same rights. And as an investor, you can then switch between the two at your option. Now, this is a slow start like most product sets, but now that platform is there. We've put product through it. We've tested it. In other respects, um, we've created a situation where investors can now go to their brokers and they can buy an, an RMB listed product using Hong Kong dollars. We have a facility in place that will allow the exchange of the Hong Kong dollars into RMB to buy the product. And as that position is liquidated, it comes back, the RMB is changed back to Hong Kong dollars and it's passed on to the customer. So we have a clearing loop here that allows people to buy product uh, using Hong Kong dollars, but it's RMB product which will help the market, I think, as we put more and more product onto the market. Um, in mid-2000, um, we launched what I think is a particularly significant product, which is um, a currency future. We have a deliverable CNH offshore RMB US dollar currency future. Um, it's the only deliverable future that's around at the moment. Liquidity is picking up. Um, again, it's a slow start, but by comparison, uh, a similar project uh, traded on uh, CME is only a fraction of what we're trading in Hong Kong. So we're very hopeful that that would become a very successful product and allow people to risk manage that currency exposure. We have um, just over 80 products, RMB products, uh, listed on the exchange at the moment. Uh, we, have a, we had three futures contracts launched yesterday, I'm pleased to say. Um, and so the product set is gradually developing. So all our existing platforms, and we are essentially, or until recently, we've been a cash equity and equity derivatives business. Those platforms are RMB enabled. We have product set on there, which is growing gradually. And as the uh, RMB pool increases, those product sets will grow. And we've enabled uh, individual investors to go and access that product set. There's two um, or three other things we've done which I think are particularly important. What we've tried to do is to extend the asset classes that we can offer people. As um, investors become more sophisticated, as the needs uh, become more around risk management, then we need to be able to offer things in other asset classes. And the big ones that we've done is we acquired the London Metal Exchange and we're now able to provide, I think, a very useful risk management tool to the mainland, uh, which consumes and produces around 40% of the non-ferrous metals in the world. Over time, once we build uh, the LME Clearinghouse, which is in progress, some of those contracts will be offered in RMB, which will provide an ideal risk management tool to the producers and consumers in China. What will happen then, as the RMB price of the commodity gets set, is all the risk management tools around that, interest rate risk and currency risk, uh, will also require derivative products. And that leads me to the next thing we've done, which was we've just built um, an OTC clearinghouse in Hong Kong in response to the G20 agreements that a lot of uh, Anita's products will have to be cleared through exchanges. Thank you, Anita. Um, but what it will enable us to do is to offer right out of the gate uh, interest rate, uh, RMB interest rate and RMB currency products on that market. Finally, um, we've had a joint venture with the Shanghai Stock Exchange and the Shenzhen Stock Exchange where we're developing a set of mainland China, or sorry, greater China indices, which we hope will become benchmark indices. 
uh, the CES 120, which has just been launched, um, is a combination of 40 shares from Hong Kong, mainland shares, eight shares, and 80 shares split between the Shanghai and Shenzhen exchanges. So for the first time, you have an index that people can use for ETFs and the like, which will enable them to get exposure to the broad spectrum of the top shares on those three markets. So in summary, um, we have seen uh, the development of products across the whole of the asset class. We've seen um, our platforms become RMB enabled, and we hope we're now well positioned so that when, as the, the pool of RMB grows and as the demands for more risk management product grows, we'll be there uh, in a good position to provide it. All right, thank you, Paul. Last but not least, let me turn to Gregory. You, your company, Air Products and Chemicals, have very significant operations in China for quite some years. Can you share with us uh, your, your, your own experience operating in China and how this development of offshore renminbi markets has been relevant or helpful to your business operation in the mainland China? So uh, just by way of background, uh, Air Products and Chemicals is about a $10 billion uh, industrial gas company. We produce and distribute industrial gases. Uh, think oxygen for steel making, uh, nitrogen to make uh, computer chips, uh, hydrogen for oil refining. Uh, and it's a very capital intensive business. So we spend a lot of money uh, building a facility typically and then have a, a customer there, steel company or whatever, that uh, has a long-term contract for 15 or 20 years. So uh, China is probably our largest growth area over the last uh, four or five years for sure and probably over the next five as well. Uh, we've currently got about 11 billion renminbi of assets on the, in the ground there or about two, two billion dollars. So clearly we have a need for a lot of financing uh, and we'd like to do that financing in renminbi given that our cash flows are generated in renminbi. Uh, up until the last year and a half, the only game in town for us really has been borrowing locally from, uh, from banks uh, like HSBC. Uh, the, uh, you know, these rates would be tied to the, to the People's Bank of China reference rate, and uh, we were paying somewhere around 6 or 7% per annum for, for, the bond, for the bonds or for the loans, uh, and also had the risk that even though we had a committed facility, there were times when the Chinese government determined that liquidity was, uh, they wanted to tighten things up and, and had this experience of going to draw at a facility and finding that it wasn't available for, for some reason because of uh, a government decision. So uh, uh, within the, the last 18 months, we've been able to get some uh, approvals from SAFE, State Administration of Foreign Exchange in China to do offshore lending, i.e. intercompany lending from our subsidiaries into China. And this has opened up a lot of the instruments and a lot of the things that the other panelists talked about here for us that we're using. Uh, the first thing we did was we created a uh, CNH facility in Hong Kong, about a billion uh, renminbi, about $160 million, uh, that was a revolving credit facility so that as, our, as we constructed our plants, we could uh, draw on the facility as needed uh, the initial idea was that we would ultimately term these out in the dim sum market, uh, but uh, in a second I'll, I'll talk about another alternative that's proved to be a little more cost efficient for us, at least in the near term. But, uh, uh, but anyway, so uh, um, you know, borrowing uh, offshore in the CNH market uh, via this credit facility has probably taken our interest rate from uh, six or seven percent down to three or four percent, and as I said, it creates a lot more uh, reliability of the funds being there. And the whole key to all this is, is really getting the safe approval, so getting the approval to bring the renminbi from offshore, the CNH from offshore, onshore. Uh, the other instrument that we found extremely valuable to us is, uh, and Anita kind of alluded to it, is, is the currency swap market. We have, been an international company, we've got a lot of cash that we generate outside the United States that we prefer not to bring back to the United States because of the, the tax hit. So we've got it sitting in, in different places. We're now able to, with the safe approval to do the intercompany loans, uh, take dollars or euros or some other currency, swap that into to CNH, and then do a CNH loan to our Chinese operating entities to, to build our projects. Uh, we found the liquidity in this market to be very, very good out to at least seven years. 
And in fact, we did a seven-year uh, loan last week and achieved an all-in effective from MV rate fixed rate for seven years of 3%. So uh, it's very, very cost efficient. We've cut our interest costs in half on a significant amount of debt. We've got about $600 million equivalent of, uh, of RMB debt out there right now. So, uh, so we certainly have, have found the, uh, the ability to go offshore to be a significant to benefit to us in terms of funding reliability, but also in terms of, uh, of funding costs. Uh, as I said before, we're also at some point perhaps going to tap the dim sum market again. The, the currency swap market right now is a little more efficient use of our cash and also provides us a little better rate, but we think that, uh, that the dim sum market will continue to grow and probably rates will come down to be competitive with, with the currency swap market. Uh, just lastly, uh, again, Anita alluded to, to currency hedging uh, with, with the uh, relaxation of the rules. Uh, we've pretty much converted all of our currency hedging related to China to offshore hedging. So our Chinese entities now either bill or get billed in their local currency, and we handle the hedging offshore in, in the offshore forward markets. And this has been, again, more cost efficient and, uh, and, and more uh, effective for us. Okay. Um, I got some question here, but before we do that, Greg, can I follow up a question? Uh, when you say you have obtained credit facility in Hong Kong, and then it's uh, cheaper, more efficient to do it that way, but can you also comment on the, uh, the, your company's operation that you're also starting to bill your customers when you do projects for them overseas in Renminbi? And uh, can you can you say something on that? What's the advantage of you doing things like that rather than billing them in dollars as you did in the past? Yeah, I mean, the, the primary entity that we have in China that, that bills offshore is we have kind of our, our Asian uh, engineering uh, and uh, construction center. And so it's primarily intercompany invoices that, that we have uh, that previously, due to regulation, were being billed in uh, dollars or euros or something. And, uh, you know, basically created a double currency exposure for us because the, the Chinese entity uh, needed to hedge in Ramimbi and that wasn't always the most efficient way to hedge. We could do it, but it wasn't terribly efficient uh, onshore. And then the, the offshore entities had to hedge the dollars or, or the euros into whatever their currency was, Korean won, Taiwan dollars or whatever. Uh, now what we're able to do, as I said, is pretty much just keep the Chinese entity whole, they will bill in Remimbi, receive Remimbi, their costs are in Remimbi, they're all matched up, and, uh, and then we've got one currency hedge on behalf of, uh, of the offshore entity to hedge offshore from their local currency into Remimbi. So it's, it's a lot more efficient for us, and, uh, and I, think, uh, I think the rates are actually more efficient and cheaper from a, a cost standpoint uh, offshore as well. Okay. Thank you, Greg. I have a question, I think, uh, for Gary. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, China has been promoting the use of RMB in cross-border trade investments. It's making good progress. Uh, but the question is this, going forward in the longer run, you think their uh, RMB will pose a threat to US dollar as the international trading and reserve currency? Hasn't defined what it means by a longer term. Okay. Any reaction on that question? Well, <clears throat> the threat to US dollar. Uh, well, actually, personally, I think, you know, the development of RMB, it's at its very early stage. And actually, you know, in 2009, when the Chinese government first allowed trade settlement in RMB, uh, you know, in the last two to three years, now the total amount of RMB uh, trade settlement, it uh, caps about 12%, 10 to 12% of the entire trade. I expect that number to grow in the next three to five years. And, uh, uh, you know, the power of a currency or the popularity of a currency depends very much on the size of the economy, on the size of the trade of that economy. And once you have a sizable trade, uh, I think the tendency is that people would like to use this currency more often. And uh, whether it's going to pose a threat to US dollar or any other currencies, the other thing actually, for the time being, perhaps what you have to look at is, is the, com uh, is the f a full convertibility of RMB. Even though China claim, you know, on the current account items, 
Chinese currency RMB is fully convertible, but there's still a lot of capital control for the time being. And, you know, with that kind of capital control, perhaps it's not so easy to claim the Chinese currency is fully convertible. Yet, at the same time, a lot of other currencies like US dollars, euro, you know, they are convertible. There is no, there's hardly any capital control for the flow of the currency. So I would say whether it's going to pose a, a threat to the US in the longer run, maybe, you know, was, as China gradually liberalized on capital control, perhaps it will become a, one of a major currencies for trade settlement. Another point, perhaps, you have to look at is whether China, Chinese currency has become, uh, is going to become a major reserve currency. You know, US dollar now is the reserve currency out of all the currencies. And, uh, you know, when you want to turn a currency into a reserve currency, you must have a very deep markets, foreign exchange market, money market, capital markets. I think for the time being, the size of the market, the depth of the market of RMB is not in comparison with that of US dollar. So for Chinese RMB to become a reserve currency perhaps has a long way to go. But in the longer run, I'm sure you know, Chinese currency will become a more popular currency. More and more people use it for investment, for trade settlement, and whether, you know, what kind of role it's going to play in the global perspective in terms of uh, currency usage, perhaps, you know, uh, the answer to that is uh, quite clear. But I would still say the US dollar will still be a major currency for trade settlement, for investment, for hedging in the future, at least. Thank you, Gary. I think uh, at the moment, although uh, trade settlement in RMB has been has developed very rapidly, it's only around 10% of China's trade is settled in RMB. That means for every hundred dollars of trade, external trade, only ten dollars settled in RMB. There's still 90% settled in foreign currencies. I think we still a long way to go before we reach, let's say, 50-50. Right. Even 50-50, I think, is only natural because China, it, we talk about bilateral trade with China, it's not kind of a currency dominating in the international trade settlements, not involving China. I have a question, next one for Anita. Uh, presumably, it's come from a uh, participant uh, from a medium-sized company. The question is, for a medium-sized company, corporate in the US, is it necessary that his company must conduct RMB transactions with banks in Hong Kong. Can he not do it through their banks in New York as there will be time differences between New York and Hong Kong? Anita. Thanks, uh, Norman. Thanks for the question. Um, if you're a mid-sized company, I think whether you're a mid-sized company, a small-sized company, a, a big-sized company, if you have any needs in RMB, whether it's for, for trade settlement, for hedging, uh, for an, a global bank like HSBC, definitely we have our relationship manager very happily serving you in the U.S. time zone. And you wouldn't actually feel there's any difference because it's uh, one bank uh, and uh, it's a total solution. And I think the, the offshore market now is getting more and more linked up. I think what Hong Kong's role is currently being the major offshore renminbi center uh, with a few cities also developing the RMB capabilities, namely uh, Taiwan, Singapore, and also London. Taiwan, Singapore already have a separate clearing bank arrangement, you know, locally, and also London is also developing the offshore centre. Uh, as Norman early talked about, that the LTGS service has actually extended, you know, um, now covering from 8:30 to 11:30 Hong Kong time. So it pretty much kind of cover you know, uh, most of the early parts of the European time zones. And if you think about hedging, actually the market is very fluid. There's no difference from you trying to hedge uh, a, a yen position or a, you know, uh, um, a Korean won uh, interest rate swap position if you're based in the U.S. Uh, banks can provide you with that services, so that's no uh, problem. And I think uh, the other flips, the other part I want to raise is uh, as a medium-sized company, I, I do encourage um, uh, businesses to really consider establishing the capability uh, to do uh, business in RMB because as you can see, the trend is growing up. If you are a medium-sized company, you try to deal with your counterparts in China, uh, you will be in a much better position to have the capability ready then 
you know, because then you would come across counterparties, whether you're importers, your exporters, your manufacturers in China, they might have specific requirements that they want certain part or the entire part of the trade to be set to renminbi. So without the capability, it will just kind of put you off you know, in terms of the competition. You know, um, thank you. I think, uh, in fact, this is why we're here. We are here to promote the use of Hong Kong as the renminbi offshore platform. It doesn't mean we encourage, we suggest that corporates in the United States, New York should bank with banks in Hong Kong direct. I think what we're trying to do is that go to your bankers. I think uh, if you go to Bank of China, HSBC, any international banks, they already have very sizable operation in Hong Kong. They are all linked up. And you do not you really need to know how those links are, are actually created. All you need to know is that can they provide the services you need. If you need to make a payment or receive a payment in Roman B, if you would need to borrow money to set to a trade or you want to make investment, you need to borrow a loan, I think your bankers should be able to provide those services. And what we're suggesting is that the best way for the banks in the US and other places to provide the services required by customers is to actually make use of the platform in Hong Kong. As I explained in my slides, there are 1,500 corresponding banking accounts in Hong Kong. That means overseas banks use banks in Hong Kong to provide the stops, the services that the customer need in their own markets and time zones. And this is why I think we don't think the customers would like to uh, so-called stay, stay up at night and try to do banking transactions with, with Hong Kong. This is not our intention. Now, I got this interesting question, I think it's for Paul. Um, What do you see the potential for international corporations? I take it to mean non-mainland China companies, big companies, international companies, moving to Hong Kong for listing, given this latest development in RMB internationalization. You talk about this dual counter, you can use a Hong Kong dollar as well as RMB for listing. Do you have anything, any, any relevance in this development together with the potential for big corporates coming to Hong Kong for listing? Well, we've, we have seen some big corporates come to Hong Kong uh, for listing, as, as I'm sure you're aware. But I think as the pool of RMB enlarges um, and as the, the ability to move um, product, if you like, across borders, the ability to finance the greater um, extent of financial instruments that are available to finance trade, for example, then it becomes much more attractive for international companies to raise money in RMB. So I think it's an evolving process, and obviously as the exchange, we're out there trying to encourage people to come to our market to list in RMB. But also, I think by facilitating the trading in those, in those counters in RMB, that will also make it much more attractive for companies to come, come to Hong Kong. So I think there's a number of factors that are, that are uh, making the environment more user-friendly for companies to come. Uh, the greater pool of RMB, the need for investment products, and the use of that RMB investment products. Um, and also our ability to connect investors with that R&D investment. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, the next question, I think, either for Gary or for Anita, for the bankers, is about the, the market volatility in the CNH market, offshore markets. Uh, the offshore market in Hong Kong is very deep compared to others, but then compared to onshore markets, it's very small. Uh, uh, the question is, that, do you think this, the size and the depth of this market in Hong Kong would actually uh, contribute to greater volatility in the offshore market compared with the onshore markets in Shanghai, for example. Gary? Lady first. Either way, okay. Any <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank right. you, gentlemen, <laughs> Norman and Gary. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, I mean, currently the daily turnover in, in the offshore renminbi combination of the spot FX as well as the um, deliverable forward, the forward market, is about 10 billion US dollar equivalent. Uh, point number two is uh, there is a total capability of uh, direct quotation, uh, renminbi CNH versus any of the major currency in Hong Kong. Uh, number three is uh, we should not take the 10 billion as a limitation, it's purely 
uh, by the underlying demand supply. So I do not see any problem of that volume to grow to 20 billion uh, very shortly. Should there be actually underlying demand and supply, whether it's for trade or whether it's for bond issuance? Uh, so I think the market, whether it's volatile, the market does have volatility. I mean, we are in the business of managing risk. Uh, but it's actually what that volatility is due to. The volatility is best mitigated when you have an increased diversity and depth of the participants from both the buy and the sell side of genuine underlying economic activities. And this is what Hong Kong actually has the strength in terms of uh, transacting uh, over 80% of the cross-border trade um, for China's global trade in renminbi currently and capturing like 70% of the FDI and 50% of the ODI and only increasing and also having the capital flow uh, into uh, Hong Kong by attracting uh, being the gateway uh, to China. So those kind of demand uh, and supply would only grow and hopefully more healthily on both sides. But volatility remains because you do have turning of the market, but volatility can be um, mitigated and manage when you have a deeper pool of the underlying. Now, if you look at what the offshore market and the onshore market uh, easily can be depicted by any curve you pull from any of the statistics, whether it's from Bloomberg or in Reuters, you can actually see that there is an increasing kind of convergence between the onshore and offshore, whether it's on interest rate as well as an exchange rate. It's because there is more kind of capability of movements uh, in terms of full capability in trade and then you know, increase capability of investment capital flow as depicted by Norman in the initial presentation of the three bridges. So when you have actually more kind of flow onshore and offshore, naturally the two markets become more kind of converging. But you do have period, for example, back in uh, 2010, uh, you have a period where the offshore renminbi rate exchange rate have been trading at a premium, i.e. more expensive, by up to 3 to 4 percent versus the onshore rate because of the one side speculation or expectation of rapid appreciation renminbi. But conversely, you do have period where in September 2011, you have a period of offshore renminbi CNH trading at discount uh, cheaper to the onshore rate by around 2.5 to 3 percent because of the uh, short covering on risk aversions. So those situations remain until you have a genuine uh, a capital comfortability and fungibility of two market, then you have less divergence. Then the volatility of either side of the market would also be supported and alleviated uh, by the onshore of the offshore market conversely. But the bottom line is in conclusion, I do not see that movements in the FX trade in the offshore market now would pose any material problem for businesses and corporates who intend to engage in hedging or investment decisions in renminbi. The market currently is deep enough and it will develop into deeper. Thank you. Okay. Gary? Yeah. Uh, well, there is always a price disparity between offshore and offshore market. Uh, because there's a firewall between the two markets, and firewall being the capital control. And uh, uh, for the time being, uh, the interest rates in Hong Kong on RMB is lower than that on the mainland. And uh, there's roughly about 50 pips difference between the exchange rate uh, of onshore and offshore market. Uh, I would say, generally speaking, the offshore market is the true reflection of the demand and supply of RMB. And the onshore market sometimes is distorted because of the intervention by the authorities. And when the disparity is large enough, you see arbitration between, you see arbitrage between the two markets. But of course, you know, legal, uh, uh, theoretically, there should be, of, uh, should be a firewall, but there's always a way, you know, some people can get around it. So there's some underground channels where people can, you know, uh, transfer RMB in and out of China and take advantage of the price disparity. But the later development is the exchange rate side of the market, actually, the disparity is getting smaller and smaller. Uh, 
the two market hasn't completely uh, merged, or in terms of price, but we used to have 100 pips or 400 pips, that kind of price disparity, but now it's only down to 30 or 50 pips. The interest rate, you know, the gap is still there. Whether, it, whether uh, the difference is going to disappear or not depends very much on the capital control remove, uh, uh, removal. So I would say, yes, you may see some volatilities in Hong Kong or on the mainland, but there is a natural linkage between the two markets. And Hong Kong cannot move, Hong Kong price cannot move too far away from that on the mainland. And sometimes Hong Kong's movement is a true reflection of the demand, early reflection of the demand supply in the market. So. In the, in the long run, with more liberalization of capital control and things like that, I would say the price disparity, either you know, it's going to narrow substantially or perhaps eventually disappear. Yeah. I think, uh, I think uh, because of the implication of time, I think last question. Uh, referring to my slides about this portfolio investment bridge, uh, can the panelists comment on the latest developments in this I think it's Al Kufi, I think, someone who has knowledge about Hong Kong. Redmond B qualified foreign in, in institution investors. Uh, can Anita or Gary come and Al Kufi? I think additional quota has been given, granted. Gentleman first. Gentleman first. Gary, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, Kufi, meaning qualified institutional investors, to, uh, foreign institutional investors. Al Kufi means RMB qualified foreign institutional investors. You know, when that scheme was introduced, that provided an opportunity to RMB holders, depositors, investors in Hong Kong to make investment into the domestic market using RMB. Because, you know, now the pool is getting larger and larger, so there's a huge demand for holding high return, high yielding RMB assets. Uh, as an opening up, as one step opening up, Chinese authorities started to allow RQ fee to be introduced into the local market starting in 2011, I think. Yeah, 2011. And of course, the initial quotas was not that significant. But, you know, at the beginning, there's restrictions on the asset class that the fund managers can, can invest. So the return was not very magnificent. The reaction of the market was not very enthusiastic. But later on, the authorities start to allow fund managers not only to buy fixed assets, but also make some investment in the stock market. And that actually substantially increased interest for our QV investment in Hong Kong. And as a result of that, Chinese authorities granted larger new quotas to uh, those fund management companies. So now we're just waiting for new products to be rolled out in Hong Kong for the retail investors. Anita? Yeah, thank you. Maybe to add on uh, what Gary was uh, talking about. Uh, I think the, the RQ fee, um, it's certainly one of uh, the, the many things in terms of further broadening up the, the bridge on the investment. Uh, it's a major breakthrough, I would say. In 2011, not only the QV is now allowed to be investing by renminbi, i.e. the RQ fee first opening up, we also have the renminbi uh, QFI, the, uh, the, the, Q, uh, the direct investment, FDI. Um, so um, that would mean that uh, the Chinese side are opening up for investment capital, whether it's actually in financial assets or in direct investment, uh, denominated in MMB directly into uh, China instead of, as Norman mentioned earlier, it has to be in a foreign currency, whether it's in US dollar or Hong Kong dollar, etc., uh, remitting into China to be converted locally. Now, the other thing that um, uh, I, I think from the RQ fee, uh, RMB RQ fee, it's uh, uh, you have. The now the capability to invest in a whole array of the domestic market investment instruments, uh, including equities and also fixed income. That would open up an entire array of investment uh, horizon 
for actually offshore RMB accumulated. The thing about just take uh, the domestic bond market, which now the RQ fee quota can actually invest into. In terms of the quantum of the size, the domestic bond market in China is well over 25 trillion. Now compare with the offshore dim sum bond market last year, we are 270 billion. So we're not even up to 2% of the domestic market. So immediately, the amount of investable uh, universe for renminbi funds accumulated offshore is widely opened up. Obviously, this is controlled by quota. You know, as Gary mentioned, initially it's 20 billion, now it's increased to 270 billion in terms of quota. Uh, as a reality or as a realistic possibility, I would urge um, customers or friends in the U.S. Uh, to open a renminbi account with your bank, uh, whether you want to open your bank in the U.S. or you know uh, whether you want to actually open uh, a bank account in Hong Kong. Now we allow um, uh, banks in Hong Kong to accept non-Hong Kong residents to open a retail account. Now, if you do open an account. You can basically buy whatever amount of renminbi uh, in the offshore market and then using that renminbi to subscribe to our QV fund launched outside of China, which they have direct access to invest your money into the onshore market. So I'm, I'm a true believer to, to really get a feel about the renminbi, get involved into it. On a personal level, open an account. On a, on a corporate level, try to establish capability to do trade or investment. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. I think we have, it's now past 3.30. It's now time to close this session. I was very grateful to the panelists for joining me in today's panel. May I invite you to give them a quick round of applause for thanking them <laughs> to join this session. Thank you.